Hello and welcome to the 14th film in the series about the standard level organic topic. Here we're going to be looking at things called reaction mechanisms. So hopefully you've just watched the film about halogenoalkanes. We're going to be talking about things which help us explain why halogenoalkanes react the way they do. If I try and cover all this in one film, it's just going to be incredibly long. So hopefully we'll go through the principles here and we'll put them into practice in the next film, which is going to be the last in the series. Okay, so hopefully by the end of this film we'll know what a reaction mechanism is. We'll be able to define the term nucleophile and see where these might fit into reaction mechanisms. And we'll understand what a curly arrow shows in a mechanism and what will happen as bonds form and break in one of these reaction mechanisms. So, first of all, let's talk about what a reaction mechanism isn't. Now, this cartoon kind of tells us the whole story, or at least it kind of allows, allows us to think about a whole sequence of events in just one picture, rather like a chemical equation, right? A chemical equation tells us what we're starting with and what we end up with, but it doesn't tell us how we're getting there. And what you might remember, hopefully, because you know that alkanes take part in substitution reactions, in radical reaction mechanisms with halogens, we could break this down into a series of steps so we could describe what was happening along the way. So what a reaction mechanism is like is more like one of these kind of cartoons where the story is broken down into small short scenes and it's telling us what's happening at each stage. Okay, now before we start looking at how mechanisms might work, let's define the term nucleophile. Now this is an important thing to be able to define. A nucleophile is any species with a lone pair of electrons which it can use to make a bond. Now nucleophiles can be negative ions and you can see that this one in yellow, I've made it yellow because it's the most important nucleophile by far in the standard level topic. We could have a chloride ion could be a nucleophile, right, because it's got lots of lone pairs. Hydroxide ion too. And these two things are both negatively charged, and a negative charge is in fact a lone pair of electrons, but let's kind of brush over that for now, and point out the fact that you don't have to have a negative charge to be a nucleophile, but as I've said, this is by far the most commonly seen nucleophile in our course, and the definition is an important one to know. So, lone pair of electrons that can be used to make a covalent bond. Having defined that, Let's now define the term curly arrow. Now I'm going to draw one for you, and that's what it looks like. Now you might think, I've just made that up, right? That a curly arrow is just like an arrow that's straight, except this one's curly, okay? But if you're asked in a test or an exam, which you might be, what is a curly arrow, because this is official terminology in chemistry, you have to be able to explain what it shows. Okay, so it's not just about being able to draw one. You have to be able to explain that a curly arrow shows the movement of a pair of electrons. Now you can hopefully see how this might tie together with nucleophiles because nucleophiles have pairs of electrons which they can use to form bonds. Curly arrows are going to show us how those bonds are going to form and how the nucleophile makes those bonds. Okay, so it's important you can draw them, but it is also important that you understand they are real things and you have to be able to explain what they mean. So, let's think about where they're going to start. As I say, if you can master these principles and always have them in mind, then the mechanisms are so much easier to learn. Okay? Now, a curly arrow will always start where the electrons are because they're showing the movement of a pair of electrons. We can start them either from a negative charge, if our nucleophile has a negative charge, but as we said, the hydroxide ion is pretty much the only nucleophile we'll, we'll deal with. So it could start there. Or if, we sh if we've shown the pairs of electrons in our nucleophile, which we don't have to, then we can start them from a pair of electrons. Okay, so these curly arrows haven't finished yet, because what I'm going to do next is show you where or we're going to think about where they might end up. Now, in any molecule that is being attacked by a nucleophile, there'll be a place where the electrons are particularly attracted. Okay, And 
The name nucleophile might suggest to you that this is something that loves nucleuses, or in other words, nu well, nucleuses are positively charged areas, so nucleophiles love areas of positive charge. And if we think about where the area of positive charge is going to be in this molecule, well, chlorine is much more electronegative than carbon. So it will make this bond polar, and in fact we could indicate the polarity of the bond. We could say that this end was slightly negative, and this end was slightly positive. And so this carbon starts to look a bit like a nucleus, because it's taking on a positive charge. So our curly arrow, which we decided is going to start from our negative charge, is going to end up in the space between the two atoms that are going to form a bond. Okay, that's one way of showing it. You can also, this is kind of the, the best way I would suggest, but you can also, you're allowed to, you're allowed to show the electrons going from where they start and ending up at this positively charged region. Okay, so what we're showing here is that this pair of electrons that the nucleophile owns ends up going to the place that attracts electrons, the nucleus type thing. Okay? But remember that nucleophiles are things that can use these pairs of electrons to form a new bond. So the best way of showing where they're going to end up is in this region of space where the new bond is going to be. If you think about it, this nucleophile is going to form a bond with the carbon. So the electrons are going to end up in this region of space between those two atoms. But if you like, you can just show them going straight to the positively charged part of the molecule. But it's un important to understand why that part of the molecule is positively charged. Now then, things you should never see, right? Because sometimes there'll be more than one curly arrow in your picture. If you think about it, if I had some atom here, it would be very unlikely that two pairs of electrons would ever come along to that atom at the same time, okay? because electrons repel one another. Similarly, it's very unlikely that you'll ever see two curly arrows going away from one another, okay? because that would be one atom losing a hell of a lot of electrons in one go. Okay? So the kind of things that we are going to see are these kind of almost like Mexican waves of curly arrows. Electrons coming to one place and scaring some other electrons away, okay? Because electrons are repelled by one another. So what will happen when bonds break? How will we show this? First of all, if a bond like this one were to break, why is it that we think that the curly arrow might look like that? Well, because a curly arrow shows the movement of a pair of electrons. Where's the pair of electrons here? It's in that bond. Why should that pair of electrons go to the chlorine? Because chlorine attracts electrons more than carbon does. Okay? But once that has happened, what will happen to the kind of characters in our scene? Well, the carbon has now effectively lost control of an electron that it used to own. So the carbon is going to become positive, and we're going to be left with a positive charge on the atom that lost the electrons. Okay? So that carbon would be designated positive now. Not partially positive, but completely positive because it lost an electron. And we're also going to have a chloride ion because the chlorine atom that used to have seven electrons has now got eight. It's got an extra electron and so it's going to be negatively charged. So when a bond breaks, in general, we can say that wherever the electrons move to will end up negative and the other atom that used to be bonded to that thing will become positive. And that's an important thing to remember. It will happen in all mechanisms. What will happen when bonds form? Well, it depends what we're starting with. Okay, If we start with a negative thing and a neutral thing, then this negative charge is going to come in here. right? Or in other words, this pair of electrons. We're going to form a bond between this slightly positive thing and the nucleophile. And now we're going to end up with something that is overall negative. Okay, Because if we started with a negative thing and a neutral thing, then this thing that we end up with is going to be negative. There's going to be a new bond here, so we could say that, oops, I'm just, oh, I'll leave that in green now. This carbon has now got five bonds. It's got three to hydrogens. It's got one to the nucleophile, which maybe I'll put in a different color. Okay, And it's got one to this thing, which we call the leaving group, because that's about to leave. 
okay but this thing overall would now have let me just put that in white just like with all ions we usually put square brackets around them like you can see with this hydroxide ion this thing overall has a negative charge because you can't just magic this charge away However, if you started with two things that had opposite charges, so for example, let's take this pair of electrons and show it forming a bond to this positive thing, because remember, this would also attract a pair of electrons. We're now going to have a bond between those two things. This carbon has now got four bonds, because we've made a new bond. The positive and the negative cancel out, so my new thing is now going to look like whatever those three things were, and also attached to this thing. And the charges have disappeared because this thing gained some electrons and this thing basically lost some. Okay? So, those things I've just talked about are really important principles. All right? They apply to all mechanisms. And if you can understand them and put them in and remember those rules, then you can basically probably come up with mechanisms yourself. As you'll see in the next film, you've got to learn some different mechanisms. It's very difficult to just memorize them if you don't understand what the things we've covered in this film actually mean. So, something missing here. One of the things we were going to talk about was what a nucleophile was. So hopefully you understand what a nucleophile is. You can define that because that's often asked. You know what a reaction mechanism is and where nucleophiles fit into that. And you also understand what a curly arrow shows. Right, so it's not just some made up thing, you do need to be able to explain that. And consider what happens as bonds form and break in reaction mechanisms to charges, to electrons in bonds, and how we can show that using curly arrows. It's quite difficult, I must confess, and especially for a standard level topic, I think it places quite a high demand. But if you've got any questions or comments, then as usual, come and see me or post a comment on the YouTube channel.